northern parts of England, southern Scotland, Wales, central southern England, even seeing some patchy rain from time to time. But we'll see some colder air across the northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland, so a frost to start the day on a Thursday morning. But through Thursday, you'll see some brighter skies here and even some sunshine across eastern counties of England as that cloud comes and goes. Across the spine of the country, damp conditions, low cloud and also some Apache rain. But through the latter part of the day, some brighter weather emerging across the southwest. Temperatures then typically coming in around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. And then it turns windy yet again on Friday with further spells of rain. Showers to follow on Saturday. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight with me, Mark Dolan. She went to Ukraine to celebrate her mother's 85th birthday, but ended up trapped in a war zone. We meet the American who's desperately trying to flee Putin's tanks. Plus, I'll give you my big opinion on some of the crucial issues of the day before we get to your vital views. You'll also get a first look at the next day's newspaper front pages hot off the press. GB News star Darren Grimes will serve up his uncompromising common sense in The Outsider. US Colonel Stuart Scheller is uncancelled as he tells us how he lost his military career for criticising Joe Biden's calamitous Afghanistan withdrawal. And reacting to the day's big stories will be my superstar panel, the former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and author and journalist Rebecca Reid. That's Dan Wooten tonight with me, Mark Dolan, Monday to Thursday, 9pm to 11pm on GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome along, day 13 of War in Europe. On tonight's Mark Stein Show, will Polish planes be in the skies over Ukraine? A COVID political prisoner is out of jail. And are we headed to $200 a barrel oil? It's up 30 bucks in the last week. And that's before Joe Biden decided to ban Russian oil. Plus the most vital part of the show. All the more important when we live in the constant swirl of a blizzard of lies your comments and questions. Do send them along by email to gbviews at gbnews.uk or via Twitter at gbnews. But first as ever, the news with Polly Middlehurst.
Mark, thank you. Uh, the top stories this hour. Ukraine's president has told MPs his country will fight to the end, echoing British war leader Sir Winston Churchill in his address. Volodymyr Zelensky was met with a standing ovation from the House of Commons as he appeared via video link. It's the first time a president of another country has addressed the main Westminster chamber. He thanked Boris Johnson for supporting Ukraine but asked for more help in the war with Russia. We will not give up and we will not lose. We will fight till the end at sea. In the air, we will continue fighting for our land, whatever the cost. We will fight in the forests, in the fields, on the shores, in the streets. President Zelensky, well, the UK and the US have announced a ban on Russian oil imports in an attempt to put pressure on Vladimir Putin. America says it will also ban gas imports, with US President Joe Biden claiming it'll be a powerful blow to Russia's economy. Britain is to phase out Russian oil imports by the end of the year. The economic impact of the sanctions that the UK has, has led has been extreme, and the Russian stock market hasn't opened uh, for the last almost a week. Uh, the, the ruble has tanked uh, and the noose is tight. Boris Johnson. Well, some news just in. Poland has agreed to hand over all of its MiG-29 fighter jets to the US immediately and free of charge as part of a plan to provide aircraft to Ukraine. We'll bring you more on that later and there will be coverage in Mark Stein's programme in just a second. Well, Ukraine's deputy prime minister says 5,000 civilians have been evacuated. It's the first successful humanitarian corridor opened since the start of Russia's invasion, created under a temporary ceasefire. The United Nations Refugee Agency, though, estimates the number leaving the country has now reached 2 million. And after much pressure, McDonald's restaurants has announced it's temporarily going to close its outlets in Russia as the isolation of Moscow deepens. It's the latest company to pause all operations in the country since the start of the invasion in Ukraine. The fast food chain said it would continue, though, to pay salaries to its 62,000 employees in Russia. And here, John Burkow has refused to apologise after being administratively suspended from the Labour Party. The former Speaker of the House of Commons was found to be a serial bully by an independent expert panel, and they recommended he never be allowed a parliamentary pass again. It was announced today Prince Andrew has paid his financial settlement to his accuser, Virginia Giffray. A document filed by both parties to a New York court called for the civil sexual assault action to be dismissed following the deal. The Duke of York has always denied the claims and did not admit liability as part of the settlement. That's it. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News. Now more from Mark Stein. And as Polly was just saying, the number of refugees who have left Ukraine is now over 2 million. This is in the first 13 days of the war, and 5% of the population of Ukraine has fled the country. Joe Biden has decided to hurt Russia's economy by cracking down on Russian oil. He knows whereof he speaks. For the last year, he's hurt America's economy by cracking down on American oil and by cancelling the Keystone Pipeline on Canadian oil. He did all that on his first day in office, January 20th, 2021. Uh, so he's vastly enriched Vladimir Putin in order to appease Greta Thunberg. That's different, as Neville Chamberlain would say. 74% of Americans are in favor of a no-fly zone over Ukraine, but Joe Biden doesn't want to impose one uh, because it would involve NATO planes shooting down Russian planes, and uh, that's what's known uh, as World War III, which doesn't generally poll quite so well. So instead, he's come up with a cunning scheme whereby Poland and other Eastern European nations give their air forces to Ukraine because they're mostly made up of old Soviet MiGs, 
which the Ukrainian flyboys already know how to operate. In return for giving away their entire air forces, the Poles and the Bulgars et al. would get entirely new fleets of American F-16s, along with a course in how to fly them. So it's win-win. The Ukrainians massively expand their existing air force. The Eastern Europeans get brand new air forces. Actually, it's win-win-win. The U.S. military industrial complex gets a boatload of new orders paid for by U.S. taxpayers. And in fact, uh, just in the last hour or so, the foreign minister of Poland has announced that they are immediately deploying all their MiG-29 jets to the Ramstein Air Base, that's a U.S. air base in Germany, and placing them at the disposal of the government of the United States of America. And it says the Polish government also requests other NATO allies who happen to own MiG-29 jets, you know them, they're the former uh, Warsaw Pact countries, to act in the same vein. And it all vaguely reminded me of something from 80 or so years ago. Winston Churchill desperately needed American help, and Franklin Roosevelt said, sorry, old man, the best I can do is leave some planes unattended up near the Canadian frontier, and uh, we'll look the other way while you tow them across the border, which they did. Actually, this was even before Winston took over. This was when Neville was still at number 10. Uh, and this is uh, a, the Alberta farmer, Joe Wilson, with his two horses, Prince and Fred, dragging a Lockheed Hudson bomber off U.S. soil and across uh, the Alberta border into His Majesty's dominions. Joe, Prince and Fred were paid between them three bucks per plane, and the Royal Canadian Air Force briefly became the only air force on the planet with horses on the payroll. And uh, over in Britain, the RAF eventually got its much-needed extra planes. Why the subterfuge? Uh, because back then, January 1940, America was a belligerent in the war, was not a belligerent in the war. Uh, America was not a belligerent in the war and didn't wish to be seen as entering in the war. So however imperfectly, it's kind of analogous to now. The main difference is that nobody knew about any of that back then. In fact, most Americans were entirely unaware of those events on the Montana-Alberta border until they were briefly mentioned in the recent uh, Winston Churchill biopic starring Gary Oldman, Finest Hour. Uh, whereas the machinations to put Eastern European NATO warplanes in the skies over Ukraine are all over the front pages of the newspapers, which is odd. If it's a cunning plan, why is it out in the open? Uh, so that Vladimir Putin knows about it and is, has already announced that he'll see that as, uh, in effect, an act of war by NATO against his country. But the Ukrainians want the planes and they need the planes. Uh, here now is a member of the Ukrainian parliament and the former Education Minister Inna Sovson. Inna, it's, uh, it's great to have you with us. First of all, uh, by the way, how, how are things in Ukraine right now? We've seen terrible things in the last few days, which suggest that the Russians are getting more vicious and, in fact, targeting residential areas just for the sake of it and uh, killing women and children just for the sake of it and threatening evacuation, uh, evacuations from urban areas just for the sake of it. What's it actually like as you see it on the ground right now? So from uh, our point of view, the situation is the following. The Russians failed to fulfill their strategy. The strategy of Blitzkrieg, of taking over the city of Kiev, of the city of Kharkiv and other cities in Ukraine in a very short period of time. They failed to do so because of the fierce resistance on behalf of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian population in general. So now completely unable to enforce any strategy militarily, they are residing to what they can do is threatening the civilian population. And they're getting more and more cruel by hour. Like those things that the whole world has uh, has witnessed of them blowing up their evacuation corridors with children dead after that. That is just unbelievable. It's extremely scary. It's extremely, it's, it's uncomprehensible how 
anyone can do that. We now know for sure that the Russian command has given orders to the Russian soldiers to shoot at civilians. That is the decision of the Russian military command right now, because they cannot fight against Ukrainian army. Because Ukrainian army, after eight years of war against Russians in Donbass, is so much better prepared, it is so, so much better motivated, and they are pushing Russians on the ground. And for the past two days, Russians didn't gain any ground in Ukraine. They were actually pushed further from the city of Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine, and uh, they are not able to enter the city of Mykolaiv, no matter how hard they try in the south of Ukraine. The situation in Kiev is extremely tense. They are really, really close to the the city, but they cannot get any closer than they got like five days ago. So they're continuing the fightings in the neighboring cities of Irpin, basically executing population there. It's 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 painful for me to see what is happening there. There are children dead, uh, wounded. Uh, they have blown up a hospital, and and it's unbelievable. But this cruelty is happening, I believe, because they cannot fulfill their military strategy, which is the result of the strength and resilience of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people. So this is how the situation looks. And, and we are extremely happy about the news that you just announced about the, uh, the jets. That is something we needed so badly because the Russians, uh, they can't fight Ukrainian army on the ground, but they can continue throwing bombs on our heads. And that, was the, the, that is the scariest part. So we do hope to fight that. What about the situation in the South? I mean, you're correct. They've made no progress, the Russians, in penetrating into the interior of Ukraine or, or coming from the north uh, to take uh, Kiev and the other big central cities. But what, what uh, do you think of the situation on the Black, uh, on the Black Sea coast? Because they seem to have been having uh, a little more success there. Are, are they actually threatening uh, to take over Odessa at any time in the near future? Uh, so in order, uh, they, they truly did take over larger territories in the south. Uh, there was not enough uh, military uh, on the Ukrainian side over there, so they progressed very fast in the first days of war. They have taken over the city of Kherson, which is a regional center the closest to the uh, Crimea, and they have been trying to get into the next city of, 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 um, uh, of Mykolaiv. So in order to get to Odessa, they need to take Mykolaiv first. And they cannot get into Mykolaiv. The defense of the city is so strong. Uh, I'm actually proud to say that some of my fellow mem members of parliament are actually on the ground there in, in the south. And they're reporting us what is happening there. Uh, Ukrainians have taken over some of their equipment. So they have blown up some of their helicopters. I believe about 30 helicopters were blown up yesterday by the Ukrainian Marines, which was a huge success. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are trying to get into Odessa because then they would control the whole axis of Ukraine to any sea. But uh, as long as Mykolaiv is standing, and it is standing as of now, and, and they have been preparing for this, uh, for, this uh, for, for, for a couple of days now, I really hope that Mykolaiv will stand and then Odessa will stand. And then the Russians will not be able to proceed further uh, north, in, deeper into the territory of Ukraine. So, so the situation in the south is indeed uh, tense, uh, but it's again, uh, it's possible to fight back even there, even in the cities which they have already taken control of. We are seeing, and it's amazing, massive, massive demonstrations, mm. street rallies of people protesting against Russians who came on tanks to their towns. The Russian-speaking towns on the south, which Putin is claiming to have come to liberate there. Yeah. Yes, that's very interesting to me um, that... He seems to have assumed that anyone in Ukraine who speaks Russian would welcome him invading. And in fact, we, we spoke to uh, one fellow from uh, Odessa uh, last week who was a Russian speaker, but he doesn't want Vladimir Putin in his life. Uh, and that seems to be the case with quite a few, even, even, in, the, uh, even in the Donbass, not every Russian speaker is a fan of Vladimir Putin or wants to be ruled from Moscow. That is indeed true. And it seems that Putin fall, fell victim to his own propaganda machine. He was telling that so much that he actually believed that. He actually believed that Russian-speaking Ukrainians are waiting for him to come. 
and we were seeing witnesses from some of the Russian soldiers who were saying that we truly believed that we are coming here to liberate people. And that turned out to be not true. And I'm, I was born and raised in the city of Kharkiv, which is in the eastern Ukraine, second biggest city. It is largely a Russian-speaking city. So I, I'm Ukrainian speaker, but the majority of my classmates would speak, uh, speak Russian at home. They are all texting me back now, and they're all saying, we want these fascists out of our land. They shouldn't come, we want to live in an independent Ukraine. And even people who were claiming before the war that we should probably try to find some deal, some mechanism of, of living together with Russia, or that they have family in Russia. I know now of three cases, just in, in, in among the people I know, uh, who were uh, friendly towards Russia before the war. Now they join the territorial defense of the Ukrainian army and fighting back. And the army that is fighting against Russia around Kharkiv, they're all speaking Russian mainly, and they're fighting as fierce as they can. Yeah, we've had all this uh, va various uh, theories as to what Putin is after in Ukraine. Uh, you were talking about the uh, if, if you lose Odessa, you're cut off from the Black Sea, and that's a serious situation. Um, th there's talk that he, he was originally going to come as far as the Dniester River, uh, which was the old, I think the old, uh, in the old, before the Second World War, that was the old border before the, between the Soviet Union and uh, Romania, as it was then, Greater Romania in those days. Um, and then the Polish I don't think he's going to get that. Yeah, no, I don't think he's going to get that far. And I think the, the, the Black Sea strategy is because he's just bogged down. I mean, when you look at the convoy, they don't, they literally don't seem to know how to drive on Ukraine roads in winter. Uh, exactly. Uh, furthermore, uh, the Ukrainian people, they have um, helped them in uh, getting lost in the Ukrainian territory because uh, one of the first things that the Ukrainian people did, uh, uh, as uh, asked by the military command, was taking down all the signs pointing direction to the different cities around uh, uh, Ukraine. So uh, they, have no, uh, they, they only have maps, they don't have any electronic devices, mm. so they, sometimes they literally would get lost because they couldn't see any signs. And the only signs that uh, Ukrainian people put uh, was, uh, you know, uh, point in the direction of where they should go. And that is not a very nice direction, but I truly believe they should really go there. So uh, they get lost and they don't have a specific strategy. And I frankly speaking, don't understand what Putin wants right now. I think he's so delusional that he wouldn't be able to explain what he wants anymore. We are seeing him of hiding in the bunker somewhere, pretending that he's meeting people, all those, uh, you know. I don't understand what he can achieve, because as of now, his army is not making progress. It is killing civilians. It's extremely, it's extremely stressful. We are all extremely concerned. We are very, very scared of the bombs falling on our heads randomly in different towns. He still is doing that, and that is why those jets from Poland, United States, are so, so important. But him progressing further is just unthinkable, because he, they are indeed facing much, much more resistance from the people than they were expecting to get. And they don't understand why, because they seem to truly believe that Ukraine will just fall down in a matter of hours. Yeah, he's he's in a, a different situation for people. People have compared it to when Stalin gobbled up Eastern Europe after the Second World War. But back then, every country in Eastern Europe had an active communist party. Communism was quite new and uh, there were ideological soulmates in Czechoslovakia and uh, Bulgaria and Romania and all these other places. There aren't really any ideological soulmates for Vladimir Putin in Ukraine right now. So even if he even if he won the war, he'd have a terrible peace in which he'd just have a, a continuous resistance and uprising against him the whole time. Uh, we don't want to contemplate on the situation if he wins the war. We still want to win the war and get our country back. But that is indeed extremely impossible to imagine. What would he do? There, there are Even those people who were supportive of closer ties with Russia are now extremely against. Ukraine has never, never in 30 years of independence been as united as it is right now. We are all staying united regardless of the political party. We did have one political party that was pro-Russian, 
But now what I have seen is half of the MPs from that political party, they are saying that Russia is an invader. It's uh, committing uh, crimes here in Ukraine and they don't want have anything to do with them. That is actually amazing because th that political party, the opposition platform for life, it's called, they have always been very, very pro-Russian. Now even they are saying that what Putin is doing here is unacceptable and they don't want to be part of that. So uh, it seems like uh, for Putin to keep control over this, this is unbelievably difficult, but he can still cause lots of atrocities, lots of casualties, lots of lives destroyed and infrastructure destroyed, particularly with him holding ground in two of the power, uh, nuclear power plants. That is still the reality that uh, we have to figure out how to fight against. Well, that's, uh, that's very interesting. We hear encouraging things. It's said that, uh, that Ukrainian forces have killed three senior Russian commanders uh, in the field. Can you, can you confirm that? Uh, yes, we got that information from the Ukrainian army and Ukrainian command. So that is as official as it gets. And some of those people were involved in, uh, in atrocities in Donbass. So that was also a matter of honor for our yeah. military to, you know, to fight back and to find those people and to punish them. OK, well, that's uh, that's good to hear. Um, and I, I uh, understand why your colleagues in Parliament who were pro-Russian are less so now. It certainly doesn't help when you're uh, firing heavy artillery into hospitals and kindergartens and uh, blocks of apartments. Uh, thank you very much for joining us in a stay safe in Ukraine and we hope to speak with you again. Uh, we'll be coming back with uh, your reaction and then we will turn to uh, another land being menaced by an authoritarian strongman. I speak of course of Canada. Canada's former foreign minister uh, will be joining me in just a moment. Don't go anywhere, we're heading right back. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Let us get to your comments. Robert says, surely supplying jets is along the same lines as training Ukraine soldiers and supplying armory and uniforms. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Uh, either you're a belligerent or you're not. And more to the point, 
is whether the other guy thinks you're belligerent. We've been saying now for months the general line in the uh, amazingly lockstep Western media is, uh, is that uh, Putin is nuts. OK, uh, so if he's completely nuts, what's he likely to do if he thinks that NATO has joined the war on the other side? Uh, Anthony, Anthony says no, but that may... Is supplying jets to Ukraine an act of war? No, it's not, but that may not be what the Russians think. Airports may be bombed, etc., in surrounding countries. Well, the thing about this is... All the surrounding countries, which is really Putin's point, are NATO countries. So if he bombs, if, if there's Polish planes there, if there's Bulgarian planes there, if there's Romanian planes there, and he bombs anywhere in those countries, uh, then uh, basically we are now, if he bombs Montenegro, for example, uh, Montenegro is now in NATO. You would think it'd be very, relatively easy to bomb Montenegro because it's a small country, not terribly important. But Montenegro's a member of NATO, which means that uh, across the planet, uh, the United States is obliged to rise to its defense. Um, a Twitter user says, if Russia had given the Taliban a few jets, what do you think we would have thought of that? Well, exactly. Uh, you would have thought, OK, Russia's now backing the Taliban. In the end, of course, the Russians didn't need to give the Taliban a few jets because the United States left everything it had in the country there for the Taliban. So they're now the eighth or ninth most powerful military on the face of the earth. Thank you very much, the geniuses of the Pentagon. And that's the trouble, really, with this. I don't mind. I wouldn't mind. I was talking a little bit about Churchill and FDR 80 years ago. I wouldn't mind a little bit of Third World War brinksmanship. I like the thrill. It's like an uh, old Saturday morning serial ending with the cliffhanger ending or with the, the maiden tied to the railroad tracks as the express is barreling down. I don't mind the cliffhanger ending a little bit of uh, geopolitical brinksmanship. Uh, when it's relatively together, guys, when it's these bozos at the Pentagon, when it's Joe Biden and it's Anthony Blinken, and when the other guy is sitting on the biggest nuclear stockpile on the planet, I don't know whether I'm in the mood for playing nuclear brinksmanship with that. Gail says, if Putin thinks it's an act of war, then it will be an act of war. There's no point asking what the West thinks. That's the thing, you know, it may be helpful to provide an off-ramp for this guy uh, because if there, isn't an, if there isn't an express checkout on this thing, uh, there's going to be real problems domestically with the Russian population. And if he thinks he's cornered, if he thinks he's cornered, uh, if you're cornered and you're sitting on the world's biggest nuclear arsenal... Do you want to bet on Joe Biden handle, handling that with uh, appropriate finesse? Uh, it's time for our regular feature, the Mark Stein Show bottom story of the day. Uh, and the isolation of Russia continues. As you know, Pornhub and OnlyFans have pulled out of Russia. And a Russian soprano has been fired from the Metropolitan Opera for failing to denounce Putin with sufficient gusto. And as if all that's not bad enough, now Quebec's national dish is off the menu because it happens to share a name with a certain Kremlin strongman. Have you ever had poutine? Poutine? It's a tasty, nutritious blend of chips, cheese curds and gravy. Let's take a look at it. Uh, poutine. Oh, yeah, look at that. Chips cheese curds and gravy you eat that three times a day you'll live to 112 i guarantee it i could pass out in that gravy it's supposedly called poutine from the french pronunciation of the english word pudding 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 you want some pudding and it was invented by uh, the chef at le roi giuseppe a casse croute in a drummondville quebec poutine dates all the way back to the 1950s uh, unfortunately, Vladimir Putin, Putin, 
also dates back all the way to the 1950s. And in French, his surname is spelled the exact same way as the Quebec delicacy, P-O-U-T-I-N-E. Even though uh, poutine the dish and poutine the murderous dictator have nothing in common, just to be clear, this is the beloved mush of chips, cheese curds, and gravy. Look at that. And uh, this is the ruthless mass killer. Yeah, look at that ruthless mass killer there. But unfortunately, because they're spelled the same way, the mob is finding it hard to keep them straight. The French restaurateurs, La Maison de la Poutine, the House of Poutine, which has branches in Paris and Toulouse, is now getting death threats because people think it's Putin's house. Uh, presumably to make up for what he's lost in Western sanctions. He's bought a couple of chip fryers and hired a short order cook in Toulouse. Anyway, the inventors, Le Roy Giuseppe in Drummondville, have now thrown in the towel and changed the name on the menu from poutine to Le Fries Cheese Gravy. Uh, by coincidence, now that Her Britannic Majesty's government is trying to freeze his bank deposits, uh, Putin has changed the name on his Cayman Islands account to Mr. Lefroy's Cheese Gravy. Uh, Alexandra Marshall, who was on this show last week, had a great line about why Canada, Australia and New Zealand had decided to compete for gold in the authoritarian Olympics. The Westminster system of government isn't exciting or romantic, and perhaps for those very reasons, it's avoided all the horrors of the last century, such as fascism and communism. But these last two years have not reflected well upon it. And in Alexander's phrase, the authoritarian Olympics culminated in Justin Trudeau seizing emergency powers and freezing the bank accounts of thousands of Canadians for the crime of giving 20 bucks to those Ottawa truckers and making the leadership of the convoy political prisoners for the crime of, quote, counselling mischief. Uh, Maxime Bernier is the former Foreign Minister of Canada and leader of the People's Party, Le Parti Populaire du Canada, and he joins me now, and we're always glad to see him. Uh, Maxime, it's, I suppose it's good news, news um, but uh, but the the leader of this of the trucker convoy who was being held without bail is now at last out of jail, although under very restricted conditions. Yes, you're right, uh, Mark. It's a good news. After more than sixteen days, she was in jail for sixteen days for a non-crime, like you said, because she Tamara Lynch was the leader of that uh, trucker freedom convoy. And um, what did she do? Absolutely nothing, raising money for these uh, truckers. And uh, these truckers were parked illegally in front of the parliament in Ottawa. And because of that, Justin Trudeau used uh, the Emergencies Act and uh, was able to freeze uh, the accounts of uh, these uh, leaders of that protest, and that was happening in Canada. Usually, Mark, when you are, when a government is frozen account, it's, they're doing that to terrorists, and they're doing that with a court order. They did that without a court order, and these leaders and some Canadians are ordinary Canadians that just want to regain their freedoms. And that's why they were participating in that protest. So it's a little bit scary in Canada right now when uh, you know that your government can uh, uh, use that uh, power to freeze your accounts or your asset in our democratic country that is not so democratic right now. And I believe that the fact of uh, using that and freezing account is the new uh, weapon of the Canadian government yeah. against uh, his uh, political uh, opponents. Well, well, as you said, uh, these are powers that uh, were supposed to be used on terrorists. But basically, for the last two years, many Western governments have treated their own, and particularly in the Commonwealth, uh, particularly Canada, particularly Australia, New Zealand, have uh, treated their own citizens 
as if uh, we're all members of ISIS or Al Qaeda, and it's uh, uh, and and. They're not, uh, they show no signs of wanting to give up these powers. You had an interesting thread on Twitter uh, about the move to a so-called cashless society, which is, which is now a gathering steam, in which you seem to imply that basically everybody, everybody wants to move to a cashless society because it will make it easier for the government to track every single thing we do. And in, in these COVID years, I remember going, just going into a little uh, convenience store and I was just buying a whatever it was, a cup of coffee and a Mars bar. And, and uh, the, uh, the lady behind the cash register said, oh, no, no, we don't take cash anymore because it's a public health risk. You might have COVID germs all over it. So COVID seems to have assisted in moving us towards a digital currency, trackable transactions for every uh, penny you spend, basically. Absolutely. I think it's uh, in the agenda of the uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, and, you know, they want to push that uh, that kind of money, uh, a world without cash. And we are against that. You know, uh, our political party is for individual freedom and personal responsibility and less government intervention in our day to day life. That will be a tool that central banks can use. And, you know, that can be something that can become like a social credit in China. Uh, we are not there, mm. but that's a direction that if we have that kind of money, it can go there. And we want to stop that right now. And people must have the right to use their accounts, have money, uh, cash money. Uh, and so that's, um, that's uh, scary. Uh, I don't want to live in a, in, mm. in, in a society where the government will know everything about you. When they are able to know mm. what you're doing with your cash, the government is able to know what you, what you prefer, what you're doing, where you're spending your money, and it's too much information for a government. Somebody told me, I don't know, I don't remember who, but when the government <laughs> knows everything about you, that's a tyranny. And when you know everything about the mm. government, that's democracy. And, you know, we are crossing yep. that line right now in Canada and maybe in other countries. And that's scary. Yeah, no, you're, that's, a, that's a very good way of putting it. Canada is an unusual case because if you look at uh, Boris Johnson, he's backing off. Uh, he's backed off, at least in England and Northern Ireland, some of these things. If you look at Monsieur Macron, he basically has thrown out all the... Uh, uh, the uh, emergency measures. But we saw uh, Justin Trudeau land at RAF Northolt uh, yesterday. He's at the top of the airplane steps and he's wearing a black mask in the middle of the open air in case he should accidentally give COVID to a passing sparrow or any other creature flying by. He's wearing that thing, stupid mask, on the top of the airplane steps. Then five, uh, 20 minutes later, he's in Windsor Castle with the Queen, and he's nose to nose with uh, her nonagenarian majesty, and clasping her with both hands, the, the super infectious double handshake. It's almost as if COVID is just a joke to these guys, as if it's all just pointless theater to them. <coughs> Oh, my God, you're absolutely right. Uh, what he did in, uh, in Europe and in UK this week and yesterday, uh, you know, I'm not proud of that prime minister. Uh, it, it's a joke. Mm. It's a joke. Trudeau said uh, when he became prime minister of Canada, Canada is back on the international scene and we will be back for the good. But we are back and, you know, we are not back for the good. What Trudeau is doing is, first of all, uh, you know, is not respecting our rights. And the COVID hysteria in Canada is all alive under Justin Trudeau. But I must say that in the majority of the provinces in our country, we, uh, all the COVID measures are, are not in force anymore. It's, uh, but in Canada, uh, you cannot travel across the country if you don't have your two jabs, if you don't have mm. your vaccine passport. 
you cannot leave the country if you don't have your vaccine passport. Mm. And, and uh, if you're a federal uh, civil servant, you cannot work for the government if you don't have your vaccine passport. So that must end. Mm. But for Justin Trudeau, I believe he enjoy these uh, authoritarian powers that he had during COVID-19. And now they're switching that to the war uh, against uh, Russia. And, uh, you know, we are paying the cost with inflation and the loss of our purchasing power. It's, uh, it's, not, a, uh, it's not going well in Canada, economically and politically. Um, and that's why I believe that our party is growing, because we are there to fight for Canadians and to put our country first, not the UN and not the World uh, Economic Forum. Well, let, since you brought up the Russian thing, he was uh, he was uh, over here supposedly uh, uh, for the Russia-Ukraine situation, and he had he stood there at the podium in Downing Street with Mr. Johnson and uh, Minir Ruta from the Netherlands, the three prime ministers. Two of them are unmasked; they look like normal human beings. Trudeau's there in his mask. I don't know what that's meant. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that's meant to project. He wore his mask inside 10 Downing Street. The other two guys didn't. Um, what do you think? What do you think the situation in Russia is uh, and in Ukraine is headed to, Maxime? Because there seems to be a weird urge to escalate it, almost as if uh, they're sort of eager to to expand it into a third world war. And you think to yourself, they can't be that nutty, but they they keep talking the thing up as if they want to make it bigger. Yes, you have a point there, Mark. And, uh, you know, our party is not uh, pro-Russia. We, uh, we condemn what uh, Putin did. And the, we believe that uh, Ukraine is a sovereign country and we must respect uh, Ukraine and the, the full territor territory, territoriality of, of Ukraine, for sure. But that being said, we must know that uh, Putin, for the last 14 years, said to us in uh, Western countries that, you know, we must not have Ukraine part of a NATO. And that was clear. Actually, he did the same thing that uh, Kennedy did uh, in the 1960s when he said to Russia, I don't want to have a Russian base in Cuba uh, at my doors. And mm -hmm. that, uh, that was a good point for, for, for uh, Kennedy at that time. But uh, Putin said the same thing, and we were not listening to him. And now we have that war. It, it's a disaster, a human disaster. And so I believe that, and I hope that we'll have negotiation, and uh, that conflict must end. But I'm scared. I'm looking at the, it's always like the West wants to put more. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's scary because, as you know, uh, I don't want that to be another... Uh, uh, world of war. And, uh, you know, the, the line is very, very uh, there. We, NATO must not participate in that war. And with the no zone flight, uh, it can be something that Putin will say, you know, you are part of that. And now you are our enemies. Yeah. So I hope I hope that diplomacy will win. You know, we are for peace and prosperity. Yeah. That's uh, that's true. And those two things go together, as we're about to learn, because we've got all these sanctions now. And the net result of that is the cost of living is going to be going up for people in uh, Canada, the UK, Europe, the United States, all over the place. Thank you very much, Maxime. It's always uh, great to have your clarity on these issues. Stump the Steins coming up. GB Views at GBNews.uk, or you can uh, tweet me at GB News. Plus, America needs Russian oil, Europe needs Russian gas, so Putin may be the new Hitler, but he's also our home heating supplier. How does that contradiction resolve itself? Stick around.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Oil has been going up for the last year or so, basically since Joe Biden entered the Oval Office. It was $50 a barrel then, and it took a year to double in price and hit a hundred bucks a barrel just over a week ago. And then in the last eight days, it has rocketed up. Brent crude is now up over $130 a barrel. At 130 bucks and climbing, uh, Vladimir Putin can afford to invade pretty much anywhere he wants to. They're talking now about $200 a barrel. Russia is the biggest supplier of imported oil to the United States. Well, that's oil and that's America. For gas and Europe, the situation is even more stark. Uh, in fact, Putin could easily drive a wedge between the two halves of the Western alliance. Uh, by keeping the oil flowing to one half but turning off the gas to the other. Uh, Tom Marzak Mansa is head of gas analytics at Independent Commodity Intelligence Services. And he joins us now. Basically, Tom, what happened? I mean, there's a lot of talk at the moment about nuclear war and all the rest of it. And nuclear Armageddon is a pretty terrible thing. <laughs> Big mushroom cloud outside the window. Nobody likes to think of that. But actually, uh, Putin just turning off the gas instantly could be very devastating for much of the continent, couldn't it? It could. I mean, I think we, we're in a situation where... Europe receives maybe 30%, 40% of its gas from Russia. Uh, so suddenly turning off those taps it would, would have a seismic impact on the price of gas throughout the continent. Now, to bear in mind that gas currently, the, the GB, the British uh, NBP price, the, the price of wholesale gas in, in Britain, um, today closed around five pounds per therm. Yesterday, it had an all-time high of eight pounds a therm. This is a market that typically is 40p a therm. So in the last uh, six, nine months, we've seen this price rise across in Britain and across the continent um, as, as the market's become tighter. And then the events of the last three weeks have really, really caused that price to shoot up even more. So if we lost supply from Russia, the price would go even higher and it would have a big impact. Yeah, it's, it's quite odd because we've got this wartime measures with everything but uh, gas, as it were. So in other words, uh, major, you know, IKEA has pulled out of Russia, for example, closed its stores there. But at the same time, everybody's expecting uh, him to keep sending the gas uh, to West, uh, Western Europe's way. 
If that doesn't happen, who does he sell that gas to? Does he sell it to the Chinese? No, he he doesn't have options. This is the point. So the the entire of the Western Siberian gas infrastructure is, is designed to feed Europe and, and Turkey. And so if he's not selling to those markets, he, he has no other customer base. There is a pipeline that connects Russia to China, but it's not connected to that huge Western sub Siberian grid. So that's not really an option. And Russia has some optionality in liquefied natural gas, you know, ga gas on tankers uh, that float around the world. But again, these facilities are already running at maximum capacity in, in Sakhalin, that's in the far east of Russia, and, 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 and Yamal, which is in the, in, the, in the Siberian north. But they're running at max capacity. So any unused production, if the pipes stop to, stop to heading to Europe, certainly can't go anywhere. And what happens then, just to look at it from the other way, if it, it, he hasn't got anybody else to get the gas to, uh, he might have customers, but he doesn't have the grid to deliver it to them. Uh, what, what happens to his European customers? I mean, what does Germany do if suddenly there's no Russian gas? Who else is out there? Well, this is precisely the problem, really, and, and the situation why Germany in particular is stuck in a rock between a rock and a hard place in that it would, I think, you know, politically, it really wants to sanction uh, what's going on in Russia, but it's too dependent upon it. And there is no other source of gas. There is no, um, you know, the Norwegian gas infrastructure is running at maximum capacity. Algerian pipeline capacity is, is, is at max. And, and again, that global LNG market um, all those liquefaction terminals, be they in the US or Qatar, Australia, they're also running at maximum capacity. So no one's really got any spare molecules floating around apart from Russia, and they don't want to sell it to Europe, and, and Europe doesn't want to buy it from them. So it's, it's really quite a difficult situation, which is, of course, what is causing that price to get ever higher. There was a commenter on uh, Michelle Dubery's program here, a couple of hours ago who said uh, we should all be willing to wear an extra jumper uh, in the cause of uh, taking down Putin or whatever it was. I mean, is that basically the only option for Germans if they are cut off? Uh, and for other continentals, they basically are wearing an extra sweater while they're sitting around the house, but, there isn't, but they are going to actually have to get used to having colder homes. Well, I think there's two things there really to pick up on. One is that um, it's it's not a case of Germany or, or the UK. The, the British grid is entirely interconnected with the the, the gas infrastructure on on the European mainland. So the the although Britain is not dependent on uh, the on Russian gas in the same way Germany is, uh, the, the percentages are, are far smaller. The, the grid is interconnected, and therefore the price is uh, effectively the same across the continent. So. It's not just about Germany or Italy. It would be about everyone doing it. And I think before you think about extra jumpers, um, you know, the, the, the gas market infrastructure and the design of the gas market would first prioritize, would always prioritize um, people in their homes. So if, 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 if there was really very little gas around, then the first thing we would see is, of course, that power generation would become more coal-fired. Uh, we wouldn't run power stations on gas at all. We're already not ver running very many of them at all on gas, but those which remain would be switched over to coal. And of course, then it'd be the industry that um, that, that is uh, turned off or, or asked, if it's not already been priced out of the market, would be asked to be turned off before there was mm. any sorts of concern over um, supply to, to, uh, to the residential market. OK, that's that's a brilliantly clear explanation of that, Tom. Thank you uh, very much for that. We appreciate it and we shall see uh, what happens in these exciting next few days because uh, uh, a lot of a lot of things are happening very fast. Uh, let's do a quick stump this time before we're out of here. Uh, David says wars historically have been pretty impersonal, except, of course, for those on the front line. So why this time are world leaders taking it personally and issuing some unbelievable statements, including the call for Putin to be assassinated? Yes, this was the uh, South Carolina senator, Lindsey Graham, who was calling for somebody to take out Putin. Uh, it's 
deeply bizarre, actually, and uh, is not something to be encouraged. And if it was happening the other way around, if people were calling for, if the Russians were calling for somebody to take out Boris Johnson or Joe, well, Joe Biden's taken himself out pretty much uh, already. Anyway, that is it, but never fear. Mark Dolan is here. The Mark, the only Mark you need. The rest of us are unworthy of being his namesakes. We are not worthy, as Bono said to Abba quite correctly. Stick around for Mark. Stay safe, stay free. Hello there. Remaining windy through Wednesday with gales, particularly through the morning towards the northwest and also some heavy rain. Brightest weather towards the south as well as the east where we'll see some drier conditions. But currently across the UK, our weather is stuck in a pattern where we've got high pressure rooted towards the central part of Europe. So any weather systems coming in from the Atlantic grind to a halt across the UK. So through the early hours of Wednesday morning, more clouds across England and Wales, some clearer skies for a time across Scotland. You can see this rain appro 